Thanks, God, and thanks, Christian, and thanks to the KISS Army, their army of students who have been helping us. And welcome to everybody who is Back when Scott and I were first discussing the organization of KISS 2012, we were going back and forth on the theme. We were saying, should we make it something about the Mississippi River or something about the interplay between real time and real time? And after one of the discussions that we had, I was checking on Google News and I saw this picture right on the front page. And it, it seemed like too much of a coincidence, so I clicked on it. And I found the following quote. In reality, that is not a static line. That is a dynamic, a morphing animal, which is called the Mississippi flow, which is from an area, a large area, to one point. The quote was from a popular science book that had just been released called Design in Nature, um, that was written by a mechanical engineering professor named Adrian Verdun. And it's all about a theory that he calls the constructal law. And the constructal law is basically this. There's a tendency for something at a high energy state to flow toward a lower energy state. And to do so by following the path of least resistance. So energy is always flowing from higher densities to lower densities along gradients. Uh, for example, water flows from a high elevation to a lower elevation. And it always goes on the steepest gradient to follow the path of least resistance. The gradient is the cause, and the flow is the effect. So it is, it is causal, but it's non-deterministic. Uh, flow moves from an entity that has something out to the ambient surround that doesn't have it. And whenever it encounters resistance, it finds the optimal path around that resistance that takes the least energy to get around it. So it, in a way, it evolves, and it's always selecting for the least energy path. A flow process can leave a trace, and often, but not all the time, but often, it leaves a, a kind of a tree-like structure. Um, so whenever you see something that's shaped like a tree, you can be pretty sure there was or still is a flow that occurred there. Um, something evolved to find the most efficient path from one point to many points, or from many large area down to a single one. Um, so the structure of the lungs shows an efficient way to distribute air from a single source out to the large area of the lungs. And a lightning strike is showing um, the path of electricity going from a large area to a single strike point on the ground. And um, the path of these resistance would be electricity. Um, there are tree-like neurons that facilitate the flow of ions. And the veining pattern in the leaf facilitates the efficient flow of water and nutrients. But the trace is just evidence of the process. Um, what's perhaps more interesting to us as musicians and sound designers is the dynamic and the actual process itself of how it evolved into that tree structure. As Bajan wrote, uh, the Mississippi River Basin isn't static. The river delta, for example, shifts every thousand years because silt builds up, and so that will no longer be the easiest path to the sea. Um, so the geologists think actually <coughs> the next shift is way overdue, and they're saying that the, it's going to shift to either go down the Atchafalaya here, or through Lake Pontchartrain. So according to Bajan, everything that moves creates a flow system. And the flow system evolves over time to optimize the flow um, through a space that's presenting differing amounts of resistance. 
So the flow of traffic, for example, uh, it starts with you um, backing out of your narrow driveway slowly, and then you pull onto a residential street that's a little wider, and maybe you go 20, 30 miles per hour. And you pull onto a city thoroughfare where you are going with more cars, and it's a wider, and you go maybe um, 40 to 50. And finally end up on a four-lane divided highway where you can go 70 miles per hour or more and you're on there with people from all different states. So the width and the speed of the channel is matched to the amount of people or the number of people who are supposed to flow through it. And uh, if it's designed well, then the flow is optimized and you don't encounter any traffic jams. You just flow in a sufficient flow. <coughs> So some of you might have started your flight here on a re from a regional airport on a little 21-seat uh, regional jet like in the Briar 170. And you might even have recognized some of your fellow passengers. Um, and from there, you probably flew to a national hub where you transferred to a plane like a Boeing 737 from the hundreds. And you had passengers there from other cities and other states. And some of you even made a connection to a long haul overseas flight on a 747 with 400 to 600 people, or even an Airbus, eight, maybe 500 to 800 other people, and they were passengers from all over the world. In the Mississippi River Basin, the longer a branch is, the wider it is, and the faster the flow is to it. And in the air travel network, uh, longer routes are always assigned bigger planes that can carry more people faster. Your home Wi-Fi network and all your neighbors' home Wi-Fi networks are probably connected by this uh, cable motor to an ISP uh, over, a, and then your ISP connects over a faster and higher capacity connection, like a, a T carrier to a network access point, which in turn is connected by an even faster, even higher capacity backbone to the internet. So there's a kind of a hierarchy of flow capacity, where there are lots and lots of small trickles feeding into a medium number of medium-sized streams, and a one and only by the Mississippi. And in chemo, we work with a metaphor of signal flow. There are multiple sources of audio signals. Uh, they join up with other sources, and sometimes encounter resistance like <coughs> or filter, and finally arrive in a single output state. And if you've ever taken a look at the, the sound, uh, the signal flow graph that is produced by a timeline, it's even more apparent. In that case, you might even see thousands of individual modules um, feeding into hundreds of uh, tracks and uh, finally going to a single output at the end. Always there's a single output at the end. Even if there are eight channels of output, it turns into a single actual pressure wave that's going to actually impinge on your eardrum at the end. If you look at the chemo sound classes, it turns out that there are about 94 of them that take a single input. And roughly a third as many as that take two inputs. And a third as many as that take more than two inputs. And those ratios are pretty much in agreement with another observation that Pajan made uh, about the traces that the flow tends to leave behind. There's only one in Mississippi, but there appear to be about five large river feeding into it, and something like 50 smaller streams that feed that, and who knows how many little tiny ones that don't even show up on the map. Um, in other words, there are, the flow tends to leave uh, a few large components and many, many, many small components. In the book, uh, the John calls the World Wide Web, the Mississippi of Information. This is a web graph that was made by Bill Cheswick in uh, February 6, 2003. And it's a directed graph 
where each vertex is a web page, and each line represents a hyperlink from one web page to another. On the web, a handful of pages have a tremendous number of links to them. And whereas there are lots and lots and lots of pages that have only one or two links. That kind of a network is pretty robust in the face of a random failure, because uh, a random failure is more likely to hit a sparsely connected page just because there are more of them. But as you know, uh, it's actually very vulnerable to a directed attack. And so that could be, that's kind of bad news for the web and for maybe for international banking. But it could be good news if this is a model of a potential spread of an epidemic. Because then you know which goes to target to what to stop the spread of the epidemic. Um, the Mississippi, I mean, the, the web, like the Mississippi, is still evolving. And um, in 2001, the top 10 websites handled 31% of the information on the web. And by 2006, they handled 40% of the web. And by 2010, the top 10 websites were involved in 75% of the information flowing through the web. So it's evolving. The genre would say that it's evolving to be more efficient. It's evolving to find the shortest path between pages. If you think about the flow of energy from the sun through the Earth's biosphere and then to the sink of outer space, um, you can notice that there are five million trillion trillion bacteria out the Earth, and um, that's. 30, uh, 5 with 30 zeros after it. And there are only 10 quintillion insects. That's 1 with 19 zeros. And only 7 billion humans. 7 with 9 zeros. The 7 billion people have organized themselves into very few mega cities that have tens of millions of inhabitants, like Beijing or Sao Paulo. Um, fewer than 100 cities have populations in the millions, like London and New York and Minneapolis and Paul. And then there are thousands of cities with hundreds of thousands of inhabitants, like San Francisco, and tens of thousands of towns that have populations of tens of thousands of people, like St. Cloud. This is a, a graph from Bajan's book showing that in Europe, the ratios of these um, town and city sizes has remained constant for the last 300 years. In other words, the, um, the population in all of those cities has gone up, but the ratios have remained the same. And he claims that that some kind of shows that there's some kind of an efficient flow of food from the agricultural areas to the city. And there's also a flow of information that goes along the social connections between the 7 billion people. For example, how many people do you think you know well enough to ask a favor? Um, the British anthropologist Robert Dunbar predicts that your answer should be 150. Uh, and he made the prediction based on a study that he did of primate grooming groups, because he found a correlation between the, the size of the neocortex and the size of the grooming group. And, and so he just looked at the size of the human neocortex and said that we would be able to maintain 150 people in a grooming group. Except that for humans, the grooming is all done with compensation. That is cool. Not less. <laughs> <laughs> But, ooh, you can probably know some well-connected people who seem to have a larger network than that. And um, their anthropologists, H. Russell Bernard and Peter Kilworth, agree with you. They, they studied some actual human social networks, and they put the average size about 290. And um, that means that some people have a lot larger networks and some people have a lot smaller. Um, there are probably some aldermen in Chicago who 
could ask for a favor from like thousands of people and get it. But there might, and some people like an international movie star or a president might be able to ask millions of people for a favor and really get it. So we, um, we should try a little experiment right now. Um, how, how many of you ever had a chance to meet and talk with the composer, uh, Yanis Zimakis, who means alive? Raise the question. Okay. And keep, just keep the hand up for a moment. Um, so I don't know if everyone can see that. How many people uh, know one of these? One of the people had hands on that. And how many people have met and spoken with one of the people who have their hands up right now? <laughs> or, or we got almost the entire room. It's within three degrees of separation of young and not. And that's an example of the so-called small world effect. The, uh, a small world network is one in which you're able to get from one node to any other in a very small number of pounds. In the small world, people are connected to each other in clusters, but a cluster is just means that your friends are also friends with each other, and that forms a cluster. Um, adding a new friend from a different cluster greatly reduces the distance between you and every other person in the world. And the reason it can work is that there are a few individuals like John Chatterby, who has quite a few connections and knows lots and lots of people. So if you happen to meet Joel during this conference, you would instantly jump to within two degrees of separation of all the people that you know, um, and, and vice versa. So that's why a symposium like this is, uh, it has the potential to reduce the distance between you and every other person in the world, because it has drawn people from a lot of different geographical areas and several different disciplines and backgrounds so that if you meet someone from a different background here, greatly, you connect it to clusters. If you want to generate a small world network yourself, one method is to start with a network that's very highly ordered, They're just something like uh, you're connected to your neighbor, and the neighbor's connected to that neighbor, etc. And then all you have to do is replace <coughs> just a few of those um, ordered connections with a random connection, just randomly pick something. And that will, um, after just maybe five of those random connections, you can really reduce the mean or average distance between uh, one node and every other node in the network. And so it's an interesting uh, region. It's a very interesting, like, transition region between highly ordered network and a random network. And this is an interesting, uh, this transition between order and randomness uh, is also an interesting place to play or sound with music. Um, I mean, complete randomness is just boring, you know, thermodynamic heat that. And completely order is also boring, but the transition with a little bit of randomness into an order network is a very interesting place to play. And I think that uh, Don Montaigne and Mark uh, Whitbath's papers are, are going to be talking about playing in this interesting area. And all of the music and live cinema we're going to be seeing is also playing in this region between Random and order, order again. What if we um, interpret a small world network as a transition network? In other words, imagine that yourself dropped onto one of the nodes of the network and crawling along the connection and visiting connected nodes one at a time. You'd be very likely to keep hitting nodes in a cluster because those are the ones that are highly connected to each other. Um, and every once in a while, you would follow one of the longer lines out to another cluster. 
and then your comments stay in that cluster for a while. This process sounds highly reminiscent of tonal music in a way, because you can think, if you think of the um, nodes as pitches, uh, a center of a highly connected node would be, the center of the cluster would be like the tonal center. And staying in a cluster would be like playing the key, and <clears throat> jumping out to another cluster would be like modulating. So, <clears throat> if you want, in, in acrosomatic music, you could think of this as representing some kind of an entanglement space. So, <clears throat> moving um, within a cluster is, is changing just a few parameters. Um, and moving between clusters, you're changing a lot of parameters at once and morphing the timbre into something pretty far away. So I tried an experiment where I assigned, I didn't uh, make, make a set of tonal pitches, I just randomly assigned pitches to the nodes of a, of a small world network and did this process of dropping some crawler down there and having it randomly crawl through the network. And you can actually kind of hear some order to it, uh, even though it was random pitches. So I put two crawlers into the, into the network, and I put one in each channel. And then it's playing the pitches on a, um, a Morph2D keymap GA. <laughs> Triggering in schema uh, 
by using noise with hot pink checkbox, because that will generate one over F noise. And if you put a threshold on there, you could use that as a trigger that would give you this kind of, kind of bursty pattern with long silences in between. And another uh, happy talk expression that will give you some kind of uh, bursty triggering is, is the um, RAND X trigger. So in this conference, is the, the theme is about time. Does, does time flow? We, we certainly talk about it as if it flows, we, uh, but it may be, is that a metaphor that we use just for reasoning about it, or does it really flow? Um, we, sometimes we imagine that we're flowing through time, passing by events as if they were landmarks in the landscape. Uh, like, we made it through the morning session. Uh, lunch is in sight. <laughs> Or it could be, sometimes we imagine that the event's flowing by us. The summer just flew by, and midterms are approaching fast. But does, does time actually flow? Some physicists identify the flow of energy with time, um, saying that it's really the same thing. But they describe a curve of space-time as a landscape defined by different energy densities, where energy flows from higher to lower densities along the steepest radiant, which is the shortest distance in space time. Um, and they pointed out that the flow of energy shares two important characteristics with, with what we know about time, namely that um, future states cannot be predicted. It's chaotic because very small change, very small decisions at this point in time can have huge consequences at a later point in time. Um, and number two, it only goes in one direction. Because information from past traje trajectories can't be recovered once the physical representation has been consumed by the current transformation. What about the constant stream of physical and chemical and electrical, electromagnetic energy that's flowing through us all the time? You know, through, the, through our senses and bodies and brains. Does that flow we trace in us? And is it, does it leave a small world network? What if our short-term memory were something like a cluster of, uh, like a cluster, there's like interconnected events, and those would be what we consider what's happening right now. And every once in a while, there's an association with some uh, recent past. That would be like a line out to another cluster. Um, and then less often, you might be reminded or have an association with something from your childhood, but that would be a, a, another jump connecting this cluster to the cluster that was going on in your childhood. But because of language and art and ritual, um, we humans can connect even further back in time than our childhood. If you read a 500-year-old book, you're connecting your cluster now with a cluster of thought that was occurring 500 years ago. If you play a piece by Bach, you're connecting your neural network to Bach's brain. And if you are playing for an audience, you're connecting all of them to Bach at the same time. Some of the rituals that we continue to enact um, Connected clusters with our really remote ancestors in the prehistoric time. So language gives us shortcuts from our own clusters to clusters in other geographical areas, and clusters <coughs> in our own past, and clusters in the historical past, and even clusters in the prehistoric past. And these links reduce the distance between ourselves and every other human who ever lived. 
And that's not just language of words, that's probably even more true for music and art and culture and ritual. Coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally, um, the word flow has also been used in the context of psychology. In the 1970s, a psychologist named Mihai Saint Mihai became fascinated with artists who could become lost in their work and just forget about eating and sleeping and, and, and everything. Um, so he started interviewing artists to find out uh, what that state felt like. And they described it as a sense of completely focused motivation, single-minded aversion, emotions that were completely aligned with the task at hand, and an absence of boredom or depression or agitation or anxiety. And this deep focus, so focused even to the exclusion of yourself. And everyone he interviewed used metaphors having to do with water or current that was carrying them along. And so that's what he called it the flow state. He identified 10 factors that tend to um, accompany the flow state. And um, they're not all required, but he just said that they tended to occur with it. And, um, among them are a balance between the challenge level and the skill that you have, and both of them being at a high level. And direct and immediate feedback, so you know when you've been successful. And he even drew a little state space where there's a skill level along the x-axis and a challenge level along the y-axis. So if, you're, if you are just getting started with schema, you might find, feel sometimes like you're over here in the state of anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> but the good news is that if you increase your skill just a little bit, you will become aroused. <laughs> eventually get into the flow state. And that's, that's far preferable to starting out apathetic and achieving boredom. <laughs> Are you autotelic? <coughs> it, it sounds like it might be a disease or some kind of a syndrome, but in fact it's, it's actually kind of a good thing. It took uh, me high. Uh, Notice that people who have a certain personality are find it easier to get into the flow state. Um, and an autotelic personality is curious, persistent, has a lack of self-centeredness, and a tendency to engage in activities purely for their own sake, not, not because someone told them to do it or paid them to do it. So it's kind of like traveling to a symposium just because you love learning. Uh, enjoy engaging with other people. So I, I would guess probably everyone has, have, have you experienced the flow state? Have you been in the flow state? Yeah. <laughs> um, so if, if you're like me, you spend some time in the flow state and you spend all the rest of your time trying to find clever ways to get back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it, it isn't just isolated to a mountaintop artistic experience, you can enter that flow state in, in any number of activities. I mean, you could, it, it could happen when you're performing on stage, for sure. Um, but it can happen in playing a computer game. It can happen even hunting down information on the web, or running a marathon, or um, composing when it's going well. <laughs> <laughs> or programming, but it's going well. <laughs> and even working in Kima, again, when it's going well. <laughs> and it is a kind of a real-time experience, because you're, when your skill level matches the challenge, the solutions appear just exactly when you need them, and there aren't any kind of robots when you get stuck. Um, that, that can even happen over time. 
a task that seems insurmountable at one point, and then so you give up on it, and then maybe many years later you look at it again and you say, oh yeah, that's obvious how to solve that. And it's it's not that the problem changed; it's just that you changed what you, you, your experiences and skill level and your <coughs> maybe some kind of infrastructure changed so that you see the solution right there and you match the challenge level. So over the course of this symposium, I hope we can continue to discuss the kind of holy grail of the flow state and different ways that we can get there, but also embracing the fact that it's the resistance and the friction and the interruptions and our ingenuity in finding ways around them that can create the most interesting dynamics in power. To, to use another flow metaphor, the workflow, uh, one way to optimize your workflow is to think, actually think about Dijon's Mississippi again. Um, think about long-term activities that flow to medium-term activities that flow to the shorter ones. Um, at the longest time scale for the Mississippi are these little tiny brooks or sources that are seeping through the soil um, down the gradient and taking sometimes random paths until they converge on these, the steepest way into forming into the stream. And that kind of corresponds with uh, building your own sound library. It's an activity that can be very detailed and low level and speculative and exploratory. And sometimes you take a path that you decide to get, you know, just abandoned. And sometimes you have some that you save. And it's better to undertake that on, on a long term, long, long time scale. <coughs> so that not, you're not under a deadline and getting frustrated with it. You just give yourself time to explore and um, learn things. Um, then at the medium time scale, are when you're working on a, a composition or doing a special sound effect, and you're utilizing those sounds that you built at the longer term time scale. Um, but you still have time to iterate, you know, go over it again and make changes um, and do several trials, you know, go over it over and over again. And then finally, the mighty Mississippi is when you're performing the sounds and the environments that you created for yourself. And that's when you steer your raft into the flow that you created at the other time scales. And this is the real time when there's no going back. <clears throat> so finding that optimal workflow is kind of like finding a balance between your skill and challenge level. Um, sort of like a bird when it's flying has to balance the effort in forward motion with the effort to, to stay and overcome gravity. So, but in our case, we're looking for the, a channel between obstacles of anxiety on the one hand and boredom on the other. Have you, have you ever been um, typing on the computer or playing an instrument and accidentally looked at your hands? And you, look, you say, whoa, what's happened? Who's, whose hands are those? How are they going so fast? And so, um, when you were first learning to type or learning to play the instrument, you were probably very painfully conscious of every movement that you had to make of your fingers. But then at some point, without even realizing it, um, that those things became automatic. And eventually, you're to the point where you can think a word and you just see it on the screen. Or you think of a phrase and you hear it, you produce it. Um, so like the flow of water in the river, the flow of control is also hierarchical. And it gives you this sense that you're controlling the high level and that um, the other is just happening. Um, so if, I think it might be when your muscle memory and your physical skill level are balanced and matched with your executive planning capacity and your you know, self critiquing capacity. And that, that's when you can enter a flow state. And there was a brain imaging study published in 2010 that confirms what we kind of already knew from experience. Um, 
the paper is called The Improvising Brain. And researchers Aaron L. Berkowitz and Daniel Ansari used functional MRI to look at the brains of musicians and non-musicians who are performing a simple task, you know, probably the simplest uh, task that they could come up with that involved improvisation. And that was um, playing novel five-note <laughs> melodies on the keyboard while you're lying down in this MRI machine. <laughs> So they, uh, they were very interested to compare the brain activity in musicians versus non-musicians while they were performing this task. And, uh, and expecting to find higher levels of brain activity in the musicians. But in fact, they found the opposite. They found that the musicians were tending to deactivate a part of their brain when they were improvising. And it's a part called the right temporal parietal junction RTPJ. And that's a region of the brain that's thought to be involved in integrating low-level sensory information to get your attention. So there's a lot of noise. That part of the brain is activated to cause you to look and make sure that everything's OK. Um, so they were speculating. They didn't really know for sure why that would be deactivated during the conversation. But they thought it might be that musicians had trained themselves to be able to enter a focused state of total attention where they wouldn't be distracted by you know, extraneous sounds that weren't relevant. Um, and they also thought it might have to do with uh, that the musicians were able to do the task in a more top-down and goal-directed way. Uh, and, and the non-musicians actually had to look at the fingers and hear every single note to know what they were playing. But the musicians were already thinking of the next five months while they were playing the first one. So the sense of flow in a real-time performance depends in part on having uh, being able to control things in a top-down way. Uh, if, if you perform light and chemo, you already know that there are at least two different states of mind. Um, which in keeping with the theme of the conference are called real time and real time. Um, in real time, you're iteratively designing instruments and performance environments for yourself. That, so that when you perform in real time, you can enter an ecstatic state of flow. From a practical point of view, that suggests we should design hierarchical top-down controls for our future selves, our selves that are going to go out on stage. Um, in other words, instead of putting every parameter on a fader so that you've got thousands of parameters in front of you while you're on stage, um, it might help to combine some of those parameters using happy talk so that the, some parameters are functions of other ones. And you can even take that a step further and come up with uh, presets of interesting places in your chamber space and use interpolate presets to control a whole vector of parameters with a single gesture, especially if you map that to, to <coughs> controlling it. One gesture controls a whole bunch of parameters at once. Um, and I, I think that Joel Chatham is going to talk more about the concept of fly-by-wire tomorrow morning. And on Sunday morning, um, I believe that Bill Hunter is going to talk more about different techniques for getting the flow state and the names for it. A piece of music or a film or game composed in real time shows all the characteristics of having been formed by a flow. It has that signature power law distribution where you have millions of samples going into thousands of events. Those events are grouped into hundreds of gestures, and maybe those are grouped into tens of compositions that we've made. And some of the compositions might be grouped into cycles, or, um, or even there's the entire evolution of style of music over centuries. So in some sense, when you're composing in real time, you're, you're designing a flow. An improvised piece for real-time cinema looks 
more like a flow that's in the process of evolving. Events happening right now, <coughs> by gestures and phrases and sounds that were heard earlier in the same performance, which in turn were fed by a lifetime of musical training um, and may show up in the form of quotation um, or just style. And that's in turn is fed by a cultural memory of all the artists in the world. But obviously no music is all one or the other. You can, when you perform a composed piece, you're performing that in real time. And you can work out structure for improvisation before you go out on stage and on your own. So it may be that doing something in real time is participating in the evolution of the flow rather than creating the final trace that the flow has <coughs> behind. You're making things happen, it's, so it's causal, but it's not totally predictable because every small decision you make could take the music in a very different direction in the future. Um, and like time, it's one directional. You can't go back and redo anything. You can repeat it, but it's not redo. Real time is like stepping outside of the flow. So you can jump to any point in time and even manipulate the flow. It's like a girdle's eye view of time because you're outside the system. And you can see and access all of time at once, repeatedly, and experience it instead of experiencing it in only one direction sequentially. It's more like building your small world network, whereas real-time performance is more like traversing that transition. So real-time is being able to see the entire river basin all at once as it formed over millions of years. Whereas real-time is like shooting down the rapids in a rubber raft, trying not to run into rocks. So I would like to welcome all of you to your KISS 2012, and I think it's time for the flow of information to begin.